the talk, but uh, it's so interesting and important. So we still see the people will turn out in a uh, few minutes. Yeah. Um, but this is very valuable time for us to have a think of it. Next day to to give us talk before you leave us. Yes. Okay. Over the past few months, uh, we have been together sharing the thoughts and uh, see the growth of students. So uh, by the end of this year, we're very happy to have the Inkman to share what he observed, what he has been observing, and uh, what he thought about the future, about the climate change. Um, actually, this has been a harder and harder issue. Um, and very, very sadly, which is not, see, not many good news being revealed. So uh, when we talk about this talk, this topic, I don't feel very, not too excited, uh, but we are very worried. So uh, how do we see through this uh, climate change phenomenon, and how we political scientists see and uh, can do, uh, not, not only political scientists, but uh, all academia, overall, could uh, think together, act together. This is really a very practical question. So um, it's a lucky us to have the Anchorman to talk about this topic that this, uh, non, not few of us will be able to address. So this is quite uh, valuable to our institute. This uh, will be very valuable to you who attend this afternoon. So that's a uh, big plus to uh, Anchorman for the upcoming talk. So much, Professor Leo. Can everyone hear me? That's yeah, very well. Yeah, perfect. So uh, my name is Egeman. Um, as you can see, I did my PhD in University of Nottingham in UK some years back um, now. And uh, so my area is comparative politics and international relations usually. And I and my professional background is working in the multilateral organizations and consulting um, for the private institutions about the geopolitics and international security issues. Um, so my professional life, that's why it took me to every corner of the world, um, starting from Central Asia, Middle East, and all the way to New Zealand. And um, this research is like a, um, how can I say, like a prolonged version of my research that I conducted back in New Zealand mm -hmm. um, between 2017 and 18. So um, let me please set the scene what's my concern and my research question and how I am dealing with this issue and addressing this issue and why I am here, of course. <laughs> um, so, um, as I mentioned, uh, I was working in New Zealand um, in a university called Messi University in Wellington and because I did my postdoc in Stockholm University and with that uh, we had a collaborative grant uh, between two countries um, to address unconventional threats to um, international organizations and the states, right? And so that's why that research trajectory brought me to New Zealand at that moment. And we, with the chief of staff of the New Zealand Army and the other policymakers, we addressed how New Zealand can tackle with the climate change, which is a big issue for them. Being an island country, um, being a small state, and surrounded by smaller states around them, such as Tuvalu, Fiji, and so on, they were quite concerned what are the threats and challenges they had. So my job was to, um, to analyze and craft uh, public policy responses to that, right? And while I was doing that, in one of the workshops, uh, the Taiwanese counselor was present, and he asked me to, whether I should want to go to, whether I want to go to Taiwan to extend this research. And I'm like, why not? And uh, me and my partner, back in the time, we found the idea of Taiwan quite intriguing to spend some time and extend my research. And then we jumped the wagon and came here. And as you can see, this was one of the um, outputs of the, what we did in New Zealand with the uh, New Zealand Defense Forces. And the chief of staff gave the um, interview. And this is the, my keynote article summarizing what we did. And we put a nice visual over there. And uh, our main question back then was the, how do New Zealand securitize the climate change and mitigate its consequences? How, how it can address it, right? Um, and to understand, dig into structural capabilities and economical 
capabilities and political responses that they can do. And while I was extending this research, um, I found some similarities between two countries, right? And one of them, which I found quite enduring, is that both countries have very ambitious aims. New Zealand has a very ambitious aim. It's a key debate in the, every election, every uh, political campaign brings back the climate change issue. And the recent government um, uh, points out that uh, they want to make New Zealand carbon neutral by, by 2050. It's a very ambitious aim. They don't want to emit any carbon tax, like any greenhouse gases, by 2050. And do you know the uh, Taiwan goals? Goal of Taiwan for that. Taiwan is a very ambitious goal as well. They want to halve their carbon dioxide and other greenhouse emissions uh, of the 2005 levels, like what they hidden back in 2005. They want to have half of it by 2050. And this was very ambitious, very very bold claim, because it's not easy task to accomplish, right? Um, and both of the countries. What we can see in the international relations and comparative politics is small states. They have structural weaknesses in the international system. So um, what, what I mean by small state? Small state, there's a bundle of literature about that. But there's one literature coming out recently from Iceland, which is a small state itself, and a scholar called Thorhalsson. Um, he is the, he is the um, how can I say, he's a leading scholar in the issues nowadays, and he he brings a novel concept of the small states, how they structure itself in the whole international system and what kind of structural weaknesses they have, such as one thing is being to uh, exposed to international economical volatility because they don't have a big internal market to feed themselves or keep off their growth and they are depending on the trade with others. So whatever the policy they do, they need to depend on either protection, economical protection, social protection, or financial protection, or even military protection. So both countries, in, in that sense, have these similarities. Um, and don't understand the small state concept here from a, like a population or geography. It's a relativistic term. New Zealand is small vis-a-vis -vis Australia, which is northern neighbor, and Taiwan is small vis-a-vis -vis mainland or whatever surrounding, like even the Australia and so on. And both countries uh, enjoy a resemblance in geography, like being an island, being an island country. Right? There's, a, there's a some resemblance as well. And there are some differences. And differences are quite remarkable in terms of economic structure of both countries. And so these were the rationale, motivation behind my um, research. Like my digging while I was here. Uh, and in, in this uh, one hour or so, in 45 minutes, so I want to like understand, I want to uh, outline what I have done, what I, how I understand, how it is going on in Taiwan. And maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, and please do so. Uh, I would really enjoy it. And also in the second half, um, as Professor Leo asked me, I would show the empirical data I did and showing the code as well that I used R software, maybe some of, our, of you are aware of that. So I will also show the coding and the results, visualization, and some minor algorithms I used to cluster the different states in the international system. <coughs> this, what will I do? Uh, so let's move on to what we say, what we understand when we say climate as a security threat. This is a very novel concept because climate is not a security threat. It is something that we, know, we flourish in, we enjoy. It is the, the thing that nurture our existence, our food, our well-being, and so on. But nowadays, in the international relations and comparative politics literature, you see more and more articles and academic research popping up and saying it's a threat now, climate change. And they use a very interesting word for it, like Anthropocene. Uh, you will hear it more and more, maybe over the time. Um, so the question is that, how we can understand it vis-a-vis -vis our traditional ways of IR theory or political theory, like this climate issue, how we can integrate it? So the, the very fundamental issue we can see is that um, now the boundary between the planet, the geographical timeline, and the human history is merging. Before that, humans 
and IR theory sees the state and human action something independent from the geography, natural geography that it operates. But now, it is merging again into something else. It's merging into um, a, a mutually feeding dynamic system. Therefore, it is not only the states or the international organizations that affects our behavior, our, our political decision making, but the nature and natural phenomenon itself. So it is a very novel approach that we need to incorporate when we are seeing the IR theory nowadays. And more and more articles are popping up um, in the Millennium Journal and so on. Um, so this is maybe the, the keynote that we need to understand. The, the difference, the disparity between the human history and the geographical history is merging into one. And as a result of that, there is a complex layer of social, natural, and technological actions that reinforce and affect each other. This, this is something that we need to um, maybe incorporate and understand more and more. But to do so, to understand it, uh, we cannot just stay in, in a solo disciplinary framework in political science or something. Because how we gonna, how we will understand the, the essence of security or essence of threat as a political and social scientist that we usually don't have so much clue on. Because when we were looking at, we were looking at the conventional threats, nuclear war, um, and the missile gap during the Cold War, or we were looking at uh, what, uh, human action and its consequences. But now we need to incorporate something outside of our discipline, so we need to extend the boundaries and make it a transdisciplinary framework. And this, um, you will hear more um, if you are digging into climate change or climate politics, being transdisciplinary. Because most of the information we acquire comes from the natural sciences. So we need to be understand when we are looking at the articles, scientific articles appearing in the uh, natural sciences. Uh, part. So this is something really interesting. And therefore, I will, uh, in a couple of next slides, I will just survey what I have been understanding when, we under, when I was digging into how climate change making a threat to uh, Taiwan, right? And I dig into natural sciences articles and the peer-reviewed research to understand it. Yes. And one of the things, again, um, when we need to understand, we need to understand the planetary boundaries we are operating in. This is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, because both in the economics and the politics, uh, the environment, especially true for the economics, the environment has been regarded as an externality in the traditional sense. It's, it, it is not um, a part of comp uh, integral component of what we are doing, uh, what we are analyzing so far. But now, since we are acting within the planetary boundaries, we understand that, okay, the nature is not doing this and later has some boundaries and we need to stay within that. And it needs to be a part of our political understanding. And again, this word, the Anthropocene, that pops up again. And it's, it's uh, more or less debated in the news, in the academic research nowadays. So uh, there's a new debate saying that now we are in the human-made era. The Holocene that operated for the last, last 13,000 years that enabled the human civilization due to its mild climatic forces is uh, disappearing due to human action and release of greenhouse gases and so on. So this is a debate to make our understanding more about the one planet and its boundaries, its limits, limits of natural resources and so on. And most of the debate comes from that. For instance, the researchers say if we go plus four Celsius degrees global warming annually, then, then we are uh, we pass the threshold. We don't know what, what can happen. What kind of other boundaries that we can pass and what kind of climatic conditions that we can encounter. And this is a scientific debate right now going on, and we need to pay attention to it. And uh, uh, one important thing is that they say it is human-made because the research shows that there's a great acceleration after the Industrial Revolution. So this is the pinning point of why humans made that. Um, the 
I want to reinforce the idea of how human and human politics and climate and human economic and political relations affect each other and reinforce each other by uh, the next uh, slide that I would like to show you. Do you know that rice that we eat, I love, I, I'm Turkish by origin, so in Turkey we eat so much rice, and, and I, I think here as well. But do you know the methane emissions? Uh, there is a breakthrough due to rice cultivation after the Neolithic age. And there's a evidence of it, very interestingly. And if, if we see this by this steep increase over here, and the methane emissions, it corresponds to the rice cultivation itself. So it shows that how humans, by the agricultural and industrial relations, affect the planetary boundaries and planet that we live in. It's a very interesting phenomenon. And there's a very interesting um, uh, graph that uh, shows. And as I say, I was trying to understand how it happens in Taiwan, right? And uh, I was digging the scientific research about that because how can I understand the threat otherwise, right? Because this threat is alien to me as a social scientist I need to understand it by collaborating with the other scientists from the other disciplines. And one thing, I, 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 when I was digging the natural sciences phenomenon and the things published on Taiwan in the academic research, Yes, Taiwan is not immune to effects of climate change. And as we see, over the last hundred years, we see at least two Celsius degree increase annual. So this is something quite harsh, and its effects are harsh. So it is not something that we cannot observe, and we can, it is something we can observe and retrieve the data from. And and that article that I was looking into, um, it was quite severe, it was showing that it can have a breakdown on the ecosystem in Taiwan itself. Since it's an island, it is even more um, exposed to the fluctuations in the annual temperatures. And this graph shows the, uh, the fluctuations and the increase in Taipei and Tainan. And Tainan mm -hmm. is close by, right? Like, you, can, you can make the understanding of the Gaoshun as well. And another thing is that um, last summer we had one typhoon, I guess, here, like hit Gaoshan. It was in August, August 14, 15, 30, it rained heavily and the winds and so on. Um, but, and I, I experienced that it was something <laughs> for me as well. Um, but another article, scientific research, on Taiwan shows that over the last 50, 60 years, um, due to global warming in the um, Pacific region, the, the the frequency of the typhoons are increasing mm. and it's almost doubling and it's becoming more fluctuating. So this global warming also creating a phenomenon that um, has a very direct public policy concern. Because if you have increasing typhoons, you need to deal with the commerce because the line of shipping you need to, because it's a small state, you are, Taiwan is depending on um, the free flow of commerce and so on. And and the human lives, landslides, floods, they need as a public policy concern they need to um, take into account. Of it. For instance, I'm I'm just to give a small note and example or note about that. I'm doing right now a collaborative research with Canadian Department of Transport. And they are using machine learning algorithms to detect to um, the they, they don't have typhoons but like the uh, the cyclones and so on. Uh, affecting Canada, so they can understand for the maritime shipping shipping that they depend on, and they can plan accordingly. And it can be something for Taiwan as well, because like we have now more frequent typhoons and so on. And this is quite dear as well. Landslides. Um, Taiwan is one of the most um, volatile regions on Earth in, in terms of landslides. Um, it, it happens quite frequently, as, as you see in the um, graphs and the projections. And this academic article mentioned that, mm -hmm. yes, due to global warming, the uh, land saturation is fluctuating so rapidly that it can create more landslides. So a decision maker should think about how to 
uh, address this issue, maybe create a rapid deployment units, so on. Uh, because if people, if they need to evacuate people or rescue people from a landslide, so these are the consequences they need to see as well. And the affected um, uh, area is increasing due to these fluctuations. Um, this creates uh, uh, more planning and so on. And another thing, uh, drought and floods. This is not directly affecting human lives for the water shortage or like um, having the floods, but also the economic activity because there's agriculture and agriculture depends on that. The fluctuations can create another fluctuations in the prices of the agricultural goods and products and the livelihood of the farmers and the urban dwellers because they depend on the food that they need to buy and eat. And um, again, Taiwan is depending on that. And being an island is more um, suspect with this kind of quality of thing. And this is very interesting. Dank fever. Dank fever is an issue here in Taiwan. Even the last, last summer we had some in Zoying area, I guess, right? Um, and very interestingly, dank fever never occurred in New Zealand. And there were cases of dank, like the mosquitoes carrying, they, they, luckily they don't have dank fever with them, but that kind of, it's Egyptia something mosquito, that certain mosquito appearing in New Zealand, which is not the common habitat, but the warming of the regions and the extending of the subtropical areas were, were carrying these mosquitoes over there. And in Taiwan, um, uh, I, this is from the, one of the public health journals, Acta Tropica. Uh, and the doctors from Gaoshan make, make this research. And they said that if we have more, uh, if we have extreme weather events during the winter, warmer winter, likely that they will see more um, dank fever during the summer. So again, the, remember the anomalies of the temperatures? It affects the public health approach as well. If these fluctuations happen, then a decision maker need to consider these issues and if there's an epidemic like that. Because um, if I'm not wrong, there are some cases for the dank fever, but still dank fever is quite an uh, uh, important issue because it can spread and uh, it depends on the personal immunities and so on. Um, this is an important issue also for the decision makers to understand. Right. And who has been in Canton recently? You know, I've been to Canton. Yeah. In the beach, have you seen the bleach corals? Yeah. I was there as well in Canton recently, and again, um, maybe even the researchers from this university, from marine sciences, they uh, monitored the coral reefs just outside of Canton, right? Just, just Canton shore. And over the three decades, two decades, the bleaching level is extraordinary. And even on the beach, you can see the bleach corals shoring. And for instance, they were pinning down to the existence of a nuclear power plant <coughs> because it increases the sur temperature of the surrounding area more rapidly than the global warming trend. And then we understand, okay, climate change now not only affects us, our livelihood, but for the ecosystem that we operate in and the ep ecosystem beside us. So this is a very interesting issue that I came across as well. And the coral bleaching happens quite unfortunately wildly all over the world right now, but this is more um, severe. Um, so for me, uh, seeing that the Taiwanese government had ambitious plan to cut down the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and transfer its economy, it was quite promising. But I wanted to see how the government wants to do that, because in the literature, there's a fundamental problem. Economic growth degrades the climate. So more economic growth, more pollution to climate. So there is this contradiction. So if any government wants to cut down their greenhouse gas, gas emissions or close down the, um, the big 
power plants that operate some oil and coal, how they gonna keep on the economic growth? Because they depend on the waters. They depend on the economic growth fundamentally. Okay, so there's this contradiction. And initially I wanted to interview uh, the decision makers. And I sent emails everywhere. The turnout rate was like 6%. So not, people were not that open to talking and sharing their experiences, especially decision makers. With me, how they plan to do it. Okay, they announce it, but how they do it. Especially I did my idea to ask this question. If I'm not wrong, a couple of last year or the year before, um, the government committed to um, ban the sales of uh, gasoline-based scooters and cars by 2035 or 50 or something like this. And then they backed down from it after the local elections um, because that was a setback. So I was trying to understand, okay, you depend on the voters, you depend on the economic growth. How do you have this ambitious goal? How do you plan to do it? Because having a goal as a decision maker is fine. You know, um, but the concrete plans of it. So um, I, I couldn't get my hands on the decision makers when I tried to interview them. But I, I had other tools as a social scientist um, to look at the data and understand how is Taiwan doing. Because uh, data maybe sometimes they think data can tell us more than the, the verbal interviews. And uh, so I took my hands and look at the um, greenhouse gas emissions over time and the economic growth. In Taiwan, in New Zealand, compare them, and I look at the global uh, economic growth and the greenhouse gas emissions, and I use an algorithm called K-means algorithm, just cluster the countries depending on their um, parameters to see like where is Taiwan and where is uh, New Zealand among the other trends all over the globe. So I did that, and the, the picture that I will show is not that promising as opposed to uh, the commitment by the government. And I don't know, um, still I would like to hear your, your opinion, how it is possible in, in terms of Taiwan and so on. Um, these are the things that they did, by the way, um, in Taiwan right now, the Energy Maintenance Act, the Renewable Energy Development Act, um, Greenhouse Gas Reduction and Management Act, Energy Tax Act, it's still drafting. I don't know what's going to happen with the elections coming, so after that, who knows what's going to happen. Um, strategic Framework on Climate Change and Adaption, and they are adapting these things, but the concrete actions still really um, require so much effort. And especially, um, uh, this, is a, this is a poll done by the German, one of the German foundations, uh, and then the, about Taiwan, what is the Taiwanese population trusting government commitment mm -hmm. to climate change? Mm -hmm. And that yeah, people are not trusting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this, this, very, this was very interesting. Because any government needs the support, any democratic, even though sometimes non-democratic ones, needs the support of the population to pass an act or like implement something, not to have like big opposition. Um, so I, I couldn't find more uh, survey data on it. Um, but I would like to see more. And also I would like, and there was some news, for instance, uh, in the election campaigns, this election coming, right? Um, some news about the, how the candidates are performing in terms of climate change to different parties, but it's not the core issue, I guess, in the Taiwanese elections. But if you look at New Zealand, it's a core issue, right? The climate change, how do you want to do it? And uh, so it shows a little bit mismatch between the popular opinion and the, uh, and the government action. So um, let me show you, the, um, as I promised, the coding. Um, so I use R uh, for this research. I'm not an expert on R. Um, the Professor Leo is the expert on R. Uh, uh, so just to walk you through maybe can be useful for your research. First, I deployed some libraries, and the R color brewery is important for me because I'm colorblind, so it's good for me. Um, so first, I import the required libraries. Uh, by the way, all this code and the markdown is available on GitHub, so you can just download it with the data set and run your own uh, uh, visualization and so on. Uh, and I got the data from International Monetary Fund, for the economic data, and the 
for the greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. I got the data from British Petroleum. They gave their annual survey. Um, these are the most complete data sets I could find. Because if we are putting Taiwan into the sets, it is not that easy to find data on Taiwan. Uh, because some organizations are not considering Taiwan, you know, uh, not showing the data set and so on. And the Taiwanese government ones are good, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to even uh, navigate through a Taiwan statistical organization. So um, first I, I create a pipeline to get the visualization, right? Um, uh, my data set was in the commerce separated value in the working directory. And I filter the country first. And then with the GG plot, put the aesthetics value on the x axis GDP price per purchase parity and the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, because why I use this um, uh, GDP PPP per capita? Because um, in the literature, the ecological economics, there's something called um, environmental Kuznets curve. Right? And this is over the last couple of decades that has been used frequently to understand how economic growth corresponds with the environmental degradation for a country and concentration of the pollutants or so on. There's so much debate on it and uh, scholars such as David Sternai, if I'm not wrong, um, in Australian National University, he's the, the key figure on that. Um, and the statistical modeling behind that uh, hypothesis theory, environmental Kuznets curve theory, it's a bit flimsy, it's not that robust. Um, but uh, still just to, sh because I didn't run an econometric analysis here, I just visualized it to see and it was enough to understand what was going on, to be honest. Um, so that's why but I used these two variables. Uh, because this is the convention, you use the carbon dioxide emissions and then you use the GDP per person capital. And then I created, I scaled the x-axis uh, in the 10, the way of 10, uh, to make it more, how is the English word? To, to make it more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, I forgot the English word for that. And then I used the, uh, to show like the breakouts or the data, I showed the 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2018, how it is going, I, I showed it. And then just, Changed the vertical, I uh, adjusted the vertical and horizontal values a little bit, and I used the, the economist thing. It's really nice. I, I like their thing. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, the magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then I just used the visuals, the like aesthetic values to show. These are just like um, aesthetic values. Like I, I put a, a horizontal line to show the 2005 values because they, they, it was their aim, right? to make the half of 2005 by uh, in 10 years, right? And we're gonna see how where's 2005 and whether it's possible to make it. Um, and then I, yeah. And then I just indexed a little bit to make everything more uh, appealing. And I just add a um, line for the financial crisis. Because remember, what was our hypothesis? The, the environmental cousin curve says that there should be, when the economical growth reaches a point, the marginal uh, increase in the environmental degradation should go down after a while due to change in the economical structure, like it more innovative it becomes, um, it more pushes to service sector and so on. And then they say it moves from the heavy industry, thus less economic degradation, right? Uh, so it should be like a reverse U-shaped curve for a country which is reaching a level. And then I wanted to see uh, whether the going down, because in, in the data I saw like there's some decrease after a while, whether it corresponds to 2008 financial crisis or it just follows the uh, uh, environmental business curve hypothesis, right? And this is the data, uh, this is the visualization I acquired. Is it visible? Yeah. Nice. Um, so this is Taiwan economic growth and the carbon dioxide emissions and these are the carbon dioxide emissions in millions of tons 
and then this is the uh, GDP per person capita, constant 2011 US dollars. And you need to make it constant to just to uh, consider the inflation changes, right? And it increases, it increases quite steadily. Um, and remember, this is 2005 values. So the government aim is to go half of it, so just to go, if it's 2000, <laughs> so just, yeah, just go here in like 10 years. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like a little bit interesting. And there's some decrease here. And I was seeing like, okay, it's something, maybe they are changing the economic structure, more incentives, people buy more Gogoro instead of scooters. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Gogoro they time. Yeah. <laughs> And then I, I saw, no, it corresponds to financial crisis. And then the trend goes on again. <coughs> so it was quite interesting for me. And then it creates more doubt in my mind how they want to issue that. Right? Um, because remember, all these trends are happening. It is happening from Dan fever to rising sea levels. Everything is happening. And one country can do so much, but they need to change their economic and political structure to correspond with the threats, um, right? And this was Taiwan, and it was interesting. And I wanted to see New Zealand, how New Zealand did like that. Um, okay. no. Yes. New Zealand has more ambitious goals, right? More ambitious game plans. And why is not happening? Huh. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I'm sorry, like, it, it will render, it's a latex code, so it will render in a second, it just shows carbon dioxide. Um, sometimes with HTML to latex, there's this rendering problem. So, yeah. Again, it is the same same code. I just wanted to get to New Zealand, right? And I filtered and did according to New Zealand and so on. Um, and, and just get the data regarding, because it's a data set with Taiwan and New Zealand that I created. It's just one, of, one under each other. So I need to filter them accordingly. Um, and again, I wanted to see the 2008 financial crisis value. And this, what I, New Zealand. New Zealand fluctuates a lot. Right? <coughs> um, one reason for that is something called Roger economics. In 1980s, they changed their economic structure. Still, there's a traumatic event. No, no? Yeah. Um, traumatic event, still. Um, government cut, subsidizes all their economic structure and the currency uh, management has changed. So they fluctuate a lot over the years. I remember uh, their, their economy is more, mostly agrarian still. Uh, they, their economy is based on tourism and agricultural production. Even here in Taiwan, you see New Zealand lamb and Zealand cheese and butter everywhere, right? And it is more expensive to buy that thing in New Zealand because they are depending on exporting their agricultural products to overseas markets. So, um, and in the in fluctuation, Within their climate or economic structure or international system makes these uh, fluctuations. And since it is a rural economy, a cultural economy, uh, yearly fluctuations happen more frequently than producing chips and uh, semiconductors, you know, is in Taiwanese case. But still, um, it corresponds, they are they're, they're quite increasing quite steadily as well on the one way, going away. And the decrease, this rapid decrease happened in their fine, corresponds with the financial crisis too. Um, so it was quite uh, sad for me to see the same thing happening in New Zealand. And they want to be carbon neutral in 10 years. 
This is so interesting. How? The gain the question, how do you want to do that while keeping the economic growth? Dilemma. But still no, no, signal, no signal about lowering that. No. No. I, they, they want to make it like carbon neutral, only uh, plant based on biomethane emissions. Nothing else they want to make. How? Same, similar companies. <laughs> um, this, this, um, then I want to show you one more. Um, graph um, that I use the K-means clustering to cluster the couple of countries according to economic development groups and then we can maybe discuss and do how, uh, try to understand the whole question. Right. Well, what does it say here? Uh, just, just close it. That's just a warning. Oh, okay. Um, so, for the next one, I see these two countries, and I was like, okay, let's see the global picture. How ca countries are doing, and there is a very simple, <coughs> robust uh, algorithm. It's an unsupervised machine learning method called K-means uh, clustering, right? And uh, it is not like Gaussian, there, is like, there are new methods right now, like the Gaussian mixtures, more powerful. Uh, uses some deep learning methods, but my, I use for now for the simple one. Maybe later on I can use the other ones to see. Oh. Yes, and again the codes. Um, here uh, I use Factor Extra uh, to get the ABO method, and then uh, GG out for the eclipses and the uh, and the and the boss maps to make the scaling. Right. But it is important because some of the values were negative and you cannot take the drop of the negative. So you need to make uh, other kind of transformation that uh, it, it is uh, that, that, that it can uh, observe the negatives, right? Uh, so yeah, again I created the sur uh, survey, a data set from IMF and BP, which was really and then, uh, since I'm using the geom text function to show the country names on the visual, I want to make them. Uh, for example, instead of writing Taiwan, I want to my, I want to write T and W, and it is called the International Standard Organization codes. So I want to use two characters of them to so I, I prevent the overlapping in the visualization. And in R, there's a library package like that. It's called country code. So you just enter the origin, and how is the origin formatted? Country name, in my case, and then output is like the two character names. So it's good. And one thing, if you are using k-means clusters, you just need to watch out that there is no uh, NA values, non-available values, non-existing values. Uh, in my case, I was sure because I compared the data set. Um, but also you need to scale it, like normalize it, normalize the data, like the um, standard, re standard deviation one and the, uh, and the mean zero. Uh, so it's just, you, in R you can just use the scale and it does it for you. You have a better understanding of it. Um, and, but the question is that, how many clusters I need to make these clusters, right? To see the world. So, and it's called elbow method. Um, so during my grad school, statistics was my like worst course, but like I, I can understand, navigate through it a little bit. Um, so the, in the elbow method, um, uh, in R again, and in the F, FBC, FBC last function, uh, you, you just give it the WSS. And it's one of the most commonly used methods to give you the, give you the how many clusters you need. And it just, it creates you a plot, and in the plot you will get the elbow area, but it hits like creates an elbow, right? And it shows like the um, within clusters. So, so four in our case seems nice. And there are other ones we can uh, cross check it, uh, like gap stat and so on. But I just I was just convinced with that one. And then after I know, like it tells me. Okay, now four clusters, 
okay, I, I, I was uh, determined to create four clusters, and uh, it was right, the machine was right. So the same with that, we will see in a, in a bit. Um, so I created the clusters with the k-means function, and uh, in my data set, I, I, uh, I picked the column three and four, uh, three, two and three, sorry, and four clusters, and tried to five uh, mm -hmm. tries to find the best one. And in the clusters object, the, there is a cluster data, and it corresponds which country belongs to which cluster. And I created a new column in my original data set called club to understand which country belongs to which club, which cluster. And then it, I, I factored that to the uh, result. And then the next thing is to visualize it. I just visualized it. Um, again, these are all aesthetic values using ggplot. Uh, it's only geom and circle comes from GG alt package uh, because I would like I wanted to make a circle around the clusters mm -hmm. to show them more. Yeah. And the transformation is like the arc sinus transformation here um, because as 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 we see uh, the log and square root doesn't work because we have negative values. Mm -hmm. It would be better. The, maybe there are methods to make. Is there maybe some methods to make it like uh, maybe uh, still make a log class transformation? But I wasn't aware, and this was the like, conventional used method. And I also wanted to like cross mark the Taiwan and New Zealand in these clusters, mm. right? And these are the clusters that we received right now. Very interestingly, for the list of all countries here. Um, you can get like Pakistan, Uzbekistan, and so Ecuador, and so on, right? These list of countries. And a second cluster, and then they are not contributing that much to greenhouse gas emissions, according to the purchasing power. And then mid-level mid countries, you would say. Okay, we have um, some Greece here. Uh, New Zealand is here because remember New Zealand economy is not that robust, not that powerful compared to Taiwan, for instance. Um, like Italy, Spain, right? And then we have the other clusters: Germany, uh, Canada, Taiwan, over here, Norway, all the way there, uh, doing well. Japan. Okay, this all makes sense, but the algorithm. Give me another cluster, China and United States of America. Yeah, this is really interesting. So the, what, what does the algorithm does? It looks at to this guy and says who I am, who I am so close to, which guy I am close to. Oh, I'm close to this. I am within one cluster. It looks at that value and these two, it became, it saw it like a um, how can I say closest to each other. Because look at their emission levels. Yeah, they, normally they would be outliers, and then it created another problem in the IR and comparative politics for me, which was, okay, all these guys are doing something here, committing, and we have China and United States just pulled over from the Paris Paris Protocol, and okay, I'm like okay, um, so. This is not a traditional domestic policy issue then. It's not a traditional public policy issue. This is more global scale, um, uh, how can I say, global scale um, consequences and actions and dynamics. And uh, I was quite interested to see that. Um, and knowing that, for instance, two of my cases here, um, New Zealand, Taiwan, and Sweden some other, I see. Yeah, Sweden is doing well. Um, doing well, but still, the most of the most of the developed countries, the United States is the developed country, and still not within the team of, within the club of developed countries in terms of environmental pollution. It is within the club of, club of China. So it creates another problem for me to analyze. I'm looking at um, Yes. And then 
uh, little bit maybe we can discuss like I have some ideas about the economic consequences and political consequences of this. Yes. So, what to do? This is the question. What to do? We run the algorithms around things and what to do. Do you know this photo? This photo? I, I, I like this photo a lot. This is the, the last male white rhino. Oh. Died. Oh. Got extinct. Went extinct. Extinct, yeah. And it, it was in front of our eyes. It got extinct two years ago. But the problem was that rhino could not do anything about that. Right, it's a rhino. It has no means, no economical power, no political power, right? And the problem is that for the climate change, because it got extinct due to climate change, because its habitat changed. Our habitat is changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. And we are just making, uh, from what I understand, from the data I saw, just making <coughs> some claims, uh, political show-offs, and so on. But it is in our hands not to be like the last rhino here. But I don't know how we are the path for that or not. Yes. Um, I guess it is just two, and uh, for the rest of the time, I would like to discuss with you, and if you have any questions, uh, answer that and have a discussion. But thank you so much. Well, that's a very impressive talk, uh, including your observation with R code and the visualization with uh, making to the broader picture of uh, the future. I think that we have the 20 to 30 minutes that uh, we can actually raise questions, open the floor, and uh, give your concerns, share your concerns with uh, the speaker. So uh, you have a microphone in front of you, and uh, feel free and to just uh, go ahead to, to raise your hand and let's talk. I think that, yeah, go ahead and introduce a bit about yourself to the, to the speakers. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your presentation on this very inter interesting topic. Uh, actually, I am not a student here, I'm a tourist. <laughs> uh, uh, I think uh, the figure you showed at the end of the presentation about the word uh, emission yeah. and GDP, yeah. the chart, uh, I think uh, I think that is your your final finding of your research, right? Um, one of the one of the uh, findings because I'm not happy with the algorithm. I would like to test with some other algorithm as well. Um, but like we can say yes, it's okay. something uh, similar. Yeah. I, I think uh, this chart is based on the cosmic curve, the economic economic growth and the uh, carbon emissions. Uh, but uh, I am wondering why do you choose uh, GDP, GDP as one of the variable and the emission of an aggregate, aggregate, aggregated yes. carbon emission as an other variable, yes. but not the carbon emission per capita. Yes, um, so I use the David Stern's method. So he produces, he suggested in his work that the environmental cosmetics shows the relation between the aggregate pollution and the economic growth per capita. But I think if you use cosmetic curve mm -hmm. to analyze a single country, yeah. then there won't be a problem if you use an aggregated uh, emission or pollution because it's just one single case. Yeah. But if you compare different countries, then maybe we should take the population amount into, yeah. Yeah, into it, consideration. Exactly. So we can see that in your chart, China, US, uh, USA, and mm -hmm. uh, Russia, they are on the top yeah. because they have a huge population. Yes. Yes, so yes. Will this be a bias in your research? Um, um, uh, yeah, I, I understand your question. So, 
if you do it like that, if, if you me measure as you say, because it's, then we are looking at the intensity of pollutions, per, if you do it per capita. And then we would see a decreasing trend because we would see it over the last decades in in all countries. So it would show that all of them are going bad. However, it would not change the fact that that amount of pollutions are emitted to the environment. And in the new Malthusian economic school of thought, right, they would say, okay, if you look at the other way down, we are biased because it doesn't change the fact that that amount of things are emitted. And so I'm, I'm like Nicolas Georgiosko, uh, the, the kind of dynamics of economic development. So his way of neo Malthusian school of thought is, would make more sense for me. That's what I use. Because the other way would be biased as well. Then, because the data and visualization would be just like, um, how can I say, um, just for us to understand. It's, it doesn't say anything. Data is by itself. You look at it, it's something. And of course, it needs to correspond to what I believe and what my school of thought is there. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's just data, it's just some figures. And in my, think, in my um, uh, thought, um, just just dri driving from the, from this um, neo maltesian school and so on, um, here we have a problem when we discount the intensity of eco environmental pollutions. Still, we have, um, what is that? We are still the emitting that amount of aggregate data. And it doesn't change. And it's not like a change that blame China or United States or Russia or anything. It is just the way it is. And it is, by the way, it's not to blame. Uh, this very important thing I need to underline. It's not to blame like the certain individual person. Um, there's a great book by um, French philosophers. It's called The Crisis of Anthropocene. So the, who is the blame? Because we are seeing some responsibility. So where is the responsibility here? So responsibility is for the, maybe the public policy rather than like the egg man, Frank, like or individuals. Because I can go vegan next day, but it doesn't change that much. Maybe. Yeah, but I, I, I have that data, by the way. I have the uh, intensity data as well, and uh, it's in my final report. But I, I, I wasn't happy with that because, as you see, it shows like all of it going down. You know, <laughs> because all of it is like over the last 10 decades, it's going, uh, last three decades going down. And, um, but I wasn't happy about that. And, and corresponding with the recent research by David Stern about why it is not like this, and I, I, I prefer that way. But you are right, that it's biased. It, it, in this case, it is it's biased, but the others is biased as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the following question is that uh, you showed four clusters in the chart, mm -hmm. I think, mm, but you, uh, I didn't care much about mm, the meaning of the clusters. <laughs> Do they mean something? Why they are in di different groups? Yes. And if, if mm, the members of the cluster will change if you use the intensity as yes. a variable, yes, it changes. Then that will. In, in, that will affect uh, the result of your research, I think, because the members of the clusters are changed. Um, yeah. So why they are in one group? Yes, um, we are different right about this. So, um, of course, if you use the intensity, the members of the cluster will show, show that picture. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get that to be if you can just help me with Yeah, of course it changes. And of course, um, I don't think the US would change. Um, but maybe the disappearing of China from the cluster to somewhere else would change the... Because then US would not be closer to China, the US would be closer to something else. And then it would change, definitely. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I use the intensity but then reading after the uh, David Stein's recent articles about that, because he is against that. Definitely he's against the person. Um, so frozen, I guess. Yeah, with the, the probably occasion needs to be restarted. Yeah. 
and that's why I use but, but we are different, right? Um, so the clusters will change, and the meaning would be that uh, the first cluster would be the least, this just to see the who is who is responsible for it. Which country is for the responsible for it, right? And, oh, thank you so much. Um, as we see the most uh, least developed countries, right? Because the GDP P PPP is, is least here. And then after that and after that. So it shows that how GDP PPP and the greenhouse gas emissions corresponds according to each cluster and which are closer to each other. So for me it was so interesting to see for instance um, uh, what is that? Um, like for instance, an EU country like Bulgaria is in the first class, right? Which they, for instance, um, uses a uh, quite heavy oil industry, and, and so on. So what does it mean for me? So who, who is the blame and who are closer to each other when I'm looking at the countries? Mm -hmm. So when I was looking at where Taiwan and New Zealand, see, I was focusing on them mostly usually here to see where are they among the other countries. Um, New Zealand fluctuates a lot, and it's over here in the second cluster because their economy is not that robust as Taiwan. It's agricultural and tourist economy, and it fluctuates a lot. Right? Um, and Taiwan, even though it is quite heavy on uh, emissions, still in the same club as Canada, Australia, you know, in, in, the, in the developed ones. So it was for me to just to see where I am when I'm analyzing it. But you are definitely right. If I check, if I make this to intensity, this won't be here. But this will be still here because it's only 300 million people are present. Like there's a billion people. This won't be here. But would it change how much emissions it puts? Would it change it? This is a debate in like recent literature, right? Because China is quite ambitious as well to cut their carbon emissions. But uh, lots of criticism comes. Okay, you got more than a billion people over there, and you still want economic growth. How are you going to do that? You know, like this is a dilemma. So for me, it would be to see these two classes. So these are the, the most robust economies in the world, and they are still on top of the figure. So just for that. But we are right. Maybe to see in two school of thought. Maybe I could just say this one school of thought: neo Marxian, David Stern, and so on, ecological economics, and the second school of thought like the emissions per intensity. That would be nice too. Thank you. Maybe talk about your country situation. Rest you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, sir, for your nice presentation. I really enjoy your presentation. Uh, I've uh, also have the same interest about the environmental issues. I think the interesting part from Taiwan is uh, not only the country uh, have the same concern about environmental issue, but also the Taiwanese people they have the concern about Taiwanese uh, about the environmental issue. What I find interesting from Taiwanese is the interest about the environmental issue because it's close with the health issue. Yeah, yeah uh, and. Because it concerned about the health, they also consider it will affect uh, their healthy and it also will affect their uh, their family condition. And I think for the environmental, there is no like one straight answer can uh, give solution for the, the climate change. And about the policy, uh, what do you think about, uh, because we, uh, from your perspective, I think it's like top-down approach because you talk about the state, about the country. How about the bottom, uh, bottom-up approach? Because this is about the climate change, but the environmental, we need also consider about how we can change people behavior toward the environmental, and we also need to consider about that. Uh, New Zealand is not considered as developed country, but the people in New Zealand, according to that, because it's in the middle, the middle income. But the people in uh, New Zealand, interestingly, they have very high interest and a very nice uh, behavioral or attitude toward environmental. How do you think about how we can 
uh, country in especially in middle income and lower income they have the same sense about the environmental behavior okay Thank um, you. yeah it's a great question um, I, I would say um, I, I wouldn't say New Zealand for the middle income country it is still like quite it's Korea is here so it is quite developed country as well but it is in that clusters um, uh, closer to like Spain Italy and so on it's more exposed to I guess um, uh, it, it's not as developed as maybe Sweden in terms of the, the economic structure, right? Uh, because like Sweden is here, for instance, um, it's a quite industrial state, which I lived there for two years, I know, and it's quite um, uh, high-tech industry, service industry, so they don't have that much pollution going on, and the, the rules are quite severe. And New Zealand, they don't have that much industry going on. They are agricultural economy. Side of the country, but like big agriculture, not like small agriculture. Um, so I, I was, uh, why people are concerned over here? Yeah, this, if, if you look at the people's concern, this is a very important thing, and um, it's it, it's a little bit out of my expertise area, and it's more like survey studies and econometrics maybe in that sense, because you need to ask people how much more they are willing to pay for adopting your policy. Um, so, for instance, in New Zealand right now, okay, again, I was showing, it is on the debates, it is on the uh, political campaigns, but if you ask her people, okay, how much more you are willing to pay, then I don't know about that. It is a question, right? Um, because the country is still like uh, dealing with the housing crisis, health crisis, you know, um, and so on. So this is one thing, for instance, if you ask a person from New Zealand, okay, the housing situation is like this because they have a terrible housing problem in New Zealand. Uh, uh, how would you deal with that? Would you pay this much more to insulate your house? It is only like thousands of dollars per month to get a single room in Auckland. So I'm not sure if it is, okay, like this is a good service that it would be. Um, and then to answer your question. Um, it's a good PhD thesis as well, <laughs> if you mind. <laughs> Thinking. <coughs> this, it's, I think it maybe it can be on the political campaign, that, but asking people and so on. I said small country for five million people, so I'm not sure about how uh, robust analysis we can get. Uh, but like the recent example in Canada, we saw it. The carbon tax through the government, just they just imposed a carbon tax and they they got still elected. But even for them, in Canada, think about Canada, developed country, resource-based country in the pioneerist region. To Alberta and so on, now they want to separate from Canada. All the oil rich regions, like there's a political campaign over there, and they say, okay, we don't want it, we want to separate. Mm -hmm. Because they are, the, through the government, got elected again, I said, I keep on the carbon tax. Mm -hmm. So, this is it. I, I don't have an answer for this, but I have questions, as you do. Mm -hmm. That will be interesting to see. You have one, okay. Um, After yeah. you. <laughs> you first? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, thank you for the presentation uh, again. I don't know about environment now. <laughs> uh, for, for me, the interesting is about your, the first question about the securitization, mm -hmm. because you're asking about how these two countries, yeah. like, you want to compare about the securitization. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and can you ex uh, elaborate more? Uh, is it like, uh, are they successful about the, how the how this okay. country and also like for the securitization you need like also the in external influence yeah, right yeah so what, what do you do about what what the it's not it, it, external influence like for a climate change maybe like the world climate change convention yeah there's a great, something like that. <laughs> great okay. question thank I you thank you forget about uh, that. yes thank um, you thank let you. me um, let me show something for you. Yes, um, thank you. So, um, OK, so when we had the convention in New Zealand, right? Yes. Um, everything, and well, there's a question here. Choosing between US and China. Mm -hmm. So for them, climate change is, yeah, very interestingly, um, it's very interesting. In New Zealand, China relations are really interesting. I would take in a while to take a look at that, really. Um, Antarctica, this is the middle of nowhere, right? Antarctica, 
In the climate change, they assume it's going to melt down some parts. And New Zealand's a part of the treaty, China as well. And something's going to happen over there. Mm -hmm. So there's something going on, like, the, okay, who's going to have the sovereign rights? And it was a very big concern for the New Zealand Defense Forces. And they are thinking cooperation or conflict in that sense. And this was a really interesting issue and a securitization for them. Not only like, okay, we have this public health and public policy issues, but we have conventional security issues as well. Yeah. And uh, for New Zealand, it was like this. And, and I think the difference between uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand could tie climate change effects to um, their conventional security mechanisms. And even the not recent defense agreement and the defense white paper, they mentioned heavily about that. Like China, rights in Antarctica, so on. And very heavily emphasized. Um, and for instance, Norway does the same thing for Russia, right? Um, because the Arctic is melting, Norway moved the recent uh, headquarters of military to Bodo, from capital to Bodo in the Arctic areas, right? Um, but also it requires money. Norway could do it, but New Zealand is right, suffering how we can move it, because they don't have that much money as Norway. Um, Taiwan, Taiwan is a conventional security issue, very conventional security issue, but it is not part of the RST thinking yet, how to manage these two threats. Right. Um, the typhoon hits and the military conflict. The water rises, I don't know, Green Island, God's answer, God forbid, but Green Island, let's assume, God's answer, water, and then what to do about that. So these are, it's not maybe yet in the thinking of military thinking yet, how to incorporate these two issues. Um, but it corresponds to the securitization theory. It's very deep, it corresponds to that. And because the, the lack of existing threat, or really heavy existing threat, so you have a limited bandwidth you need to focus on as a military personnel, military decision making against one issue. Um, it, it's very common address team as well in the securitization. Yeah, you are different, right? And now the Iceland and some others. First, very interesting, that's why the Iceland, Sweden, and New Zealand recently hold a um, NATO sponsored meeting about that. Like NATO, Iceland, like how to put them, all of them together, very different issues, but they are thinking about this, how to incorporate them, uh, and so on. And I think Taiwan has a lot to do. Taiwan can contribute a lot to this kind of debates, if uh, the insight. But thank you so much. Thank you for uh, pointing it out. Uh, yeah. I, I will take the last question. Because, um, well, after this talk, you have one question? Okay, I'll give mine to you. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm really curious about this dilemma because, like uh, Norway, they all have different industries, and India, they have different industries. But we have to make progress. We have to make people like have money. So, like, Okay, Norway can develop tourism, but India, I, I think that they have to like manufacture more, but they can, they have to emission more about CO two. So, I'm really curious about what's your opinion about like carbon trade system. Yeah, the well, system. Yeah, 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 carbon trade system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is a great question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think it would work a lot. Because like uh, it's, it's, it depends on the international cooperation and the norms still make, right? Mm -hmm. And we've seen so far it doesn't work that much. And if it happens, where are you going to put Taiwan? So it's not a part of uh, international system as we know it. So how are we going to put Taiwan and other kind of other interesting legal entities about that? Um, uh, and so and how are we going to force a, the big police in this town to cooperate with you? Uh, but how we can how we can do the economic development and um, uh, and and less environmental pollution? Um, this very interesting debate about that in the literature, and I'm quite fascinated about that. And the literature talks about the innovation, and uh, innovation can because in in the literature, um, like the environmental cosmetic literature, for instance, they the recent ones talks about how a country from the bottom here can have um, 
less environmental uh, damage due to innovation emerged somewhere else. Like we are talking about AI, precision agriculture, autonomous vehicles, virtual reality, and so on. And this kind of innovations may be the solution for it. Okay, you develop your industry, but we have new techniques adopt that and decrease the environmental pollution. In fact, this uh, report I am right now, I'm working with the Canadian Minister of Transport um, to understand whether, for instance, employing virtual reality scenarios or autonomous vehicles could decrease the energy consumption or, or and, and the environmental pollution. So that would be a great uh, thing to explore as well. And in the literature, they are called Prometheans, Prometheans flow of Thank you. After this talk, will be another workshop. So uh, I think we'll give the speaker a short break. <laughs> yeah, but before that, we'd uh, join me to thank uh, Ingerman for this uh, thoughtful lecture. Uh, if you continue to be interested, then uh, welcome to stay at 2.30, and we will have the